I'm Phil Hanlon, president of Dartmouth College, and I want to welcome you to the 28th Dartmouth Presidential Faculty Lecture. We hold this uh, annual event to recognize and honor contributions of outstanding faculty members. And it's my great pleasure to be able to be here today to introduce this year's lecturer, Lisa Marsh, the Andrew G. Andrew G. Wallace Professor at the Geisel School of Medicine, as well as the many other titles you see up there. She, she's very busy. Um, it's you know, always difficult to select a faculty member uh, from amongst the many remarkable scholars that we have at Dartmouth, but Lisa's accomplishments really made her a very clear choice this year, and we're honored to be able to listen to her tell us about her work today. Lisa is really an example of Dartmouth at its best. She's a world-class researcher working with an interdisciplinary team to create fundamentally new healthcare tools, while also mentoring the next generation of scholars and practitioners. Lisa's colleagues describe her as a force of nature, and so we will be able to witness that force in just a few minutes. At the Geisel School of Medicine, Lisa almost single-handedly created the Center for Behavioral Technology at Dartmouth, of which she serves as the director. The center is a National Institute of Health P30 Center of Excellence. And for those of you who are not in the sciences, uh, let me explain in a mo for a moment. Uh, a P30 Center of Excellence designation is given to centers doing work that is truly transformational in their field not just advancing research incrementally. And indeed, Lisa's work is transformational. She's demonstrated the power of technology to change health outcomes. A lot electronic tools that she has designed have been shown to perform as well as, and in some cases better than, psychologists treating patients with substance abuse and other behavioral health issues. The Center for Behavioral Technology has quickly obtained national and international standing. She's the principal investigator on many major grants from the NIH, as well as the NSF and others. Working with interdisciplinary teams, Lisa's research takes place at the interface between science-based behavioral interventions and evidence-based information technologies where she's engaged in probing the exciting translational and clinical implications of technology tools. Lisa is also the director of the Dartmouth Psychiatric Research Center, as well as the director of the Northeast Node of the National Drug Abuse Clinical Trials Network. Lisa formed this regional Northeast Network to test out new ways to treat patients with substance abuse. And linking with colleagues here, as well as at Stanford and Arizona State, she is probing how new technologies that she has created and is testing might work, in fact, how they might alter brain circuitry to achieve their results. Lisa has also served as a consultant to the Department of Mental Health and Substance Abuse at the World Health Organization. She publishes extensively, has made many media appearances, and has been invited to speak by the White House, Congress, and the U.S. Surgeon General as well as at numerous national and international scientific meetings. In addition, Lisa somehow manages to find the time to mentor many investigators and pre- and postdoctoral fellows, serving as a role model for an interdisciplinary group of students and colleagues. She is truly a force of nature. Her work is already known in psychiatric departments throughout the country, and the implications of her research are spreading throughout all of medicine. Dartmouth is pleased to have this breakthrough translational researcher, research star as a member of our faculty, and I am so pleased to welcome her here today. So please join me in bringing Lisa up to address you. Well, thank you so much for that uh, terrific introduction, and it is such an honor to be here today as the 28th Presidential Faculty Lecturer at Dartmouth, and I'm so appreciative to Dr. Hanlon for the invitation to serve in this role. And thank you to all of you for coming today and for this terrific show of support. Today I'm going to talk about uh, transforming healthcare via science-based technology. 
And before I do that, I'd like to acknowledge the generous support from the National Institutes of Health for the work that I'll be talking about today. And I'd also like to um, acknowledge that in addition to my academic appointment at Dartmouth College, I have an affiliation with two small businesses that are involved in developing and deploying various technology-based therapeutic tools. And these are relationships that are managed by Dartmouth College. So digital technologies, when you think about mobile devices, when you think about the web and cloud computing and data analytics, these are things that have radically transformed our society in many ways. We now do our finances online. We take educational classes online. We have social interactions online. Some people meet their significant others online. So this is very different from prior generations. And these are now transactions that occur remotely and conveniently and securely in entirely new ways. And I propose to you that we now are at a time of terrific opportunity to similarly harness technologies to transform healthcare delivery both within and outside of healthcare systems by increasing the quality and the reach of care, the personalization of care, and the cost effectiveness of care. And this is not just with clinical populations, folks with chronic physical health conditions, individuals with behavioral health challenges like mental health or substance use disorders, but also can be applied to the full spectrum of health and wellness, including preventative health. So many of you probably see and perhaps participate in this explosion of interest in mobile health gadgets for monitoring all kinds of aspects of ourselves, our activity levels, how many steps we take, our sleep cycles. And this is part of a movement to increase knowledge about oneself via new ways of data capture, and this is often called the quantified self movement. So technologies have offered us unprecedented opportunities to not only assess but also modify health behavior in entirely new ways and at a population level. So this is something that's scalable, something that can have an impact at a population level. And these technologies include uh, web and mobile devices, we see increasingly all over the world access is growing to mobile devices, even in some of the most traditionally underserved and vulnerable populations. People have mobile devices. And there's an extraordinary opportunity to harness the ubiquity of these tools for literally putting in the pockets of individuals science-based tools and resources that they can access anytime and anywhere. So we make decisions about what we're going to eat, if we're going to exercise, are we going to take medications that are prescribed to us, are we going to smoke? We make these decisions as we move through our daily lives. And there's an opportunity to provide resources in response to those decisions and helping people in making health decisions in alignment with their preferences and needs, again, on a day-to-day -day basis by leveraging these tools. There's also a lot of exciting work in the field of sensing technologies. So these are sensors that are not only embedded on mobile devices like smartphones, but also wearable sensors, sensors that can be embedded in things that we wear, such as smart watches, for example. And this allows for unobtrusive passive data collection in entirely new ways to allow us to capture this rich data, to infer new information about people's health and behavior and environment. So for example, there's some terrific research uh, looking at sensors on smartphones that can infer stress from human speech by, in a privacy-preserving way, characterize various paralinguistic aspects of speech to understand stress in human speech. And similarly, there's a lot of work in sensors that can help us infer things like sleep, or depression, or sociability, or drug-taking behavior. So new ways of data capture that can add to the richness of our understanding of behavior and behavior consequences and opportunities for innovative interventions in response to these behaviors. Social media is an understudied wellspring of health data. So social media are consumer generated media that people produce in very large volumes and the, the market leader in the space, Facebook, has about one and a half billion active monthly users. 
And so there's a, a tremendous opportunity to understand not only at the individual level, but at population level, trends in health behavior, in risk behavior, and importantly, in market demand in the healthcare space by analyzing these rich data. These are arguably among the richest big data that we have available to us. So there are increasingly sophisticated data analytics available to us to take this rich data input, this, this large volume of data from mobile devices, from, from data people input, from passive sensing, from social media, to understand health and health behavior in new ways. So for example, there's a lot of exciting work in predictive modeling where we can take these data and characterize people's clinical trajectory over time and understand when they may, may be at risk for escalation of various clinical problems and when they may be offered in the moment interventions that are technology based in response to that. So these computational models that are really personalized and responsive to people's needs and preferences. And in addition, in the social media space, there's a tremendous opportunity to mine these, datas for all, these data for all kinds of new learning, um, including our ability to have a new a level of insight into social networks and the functioning of social networks, the topology and the characteristics of social networks that influence beliefs and intentions and behavior. And we can also look at content and sentiment of this enormous amount of communication on these platforms to have a new understanding of market level trends and market demand in the health space that we could be responsive to. So collectively, this, these types of technologies allow us to have new models of data capture, new ways of understanding people's trajectory over time, new ways to inform intervention delivery that are provided based on people's needs and preferences. And arguably, this is really a, a consumer-centric focused model and, and is consistent with the spirit of precision medicine. It's not how we typically define precision medicine, but it really, it's in the spirit of providing personalized resources and tools to individuals. So one of the um, important aspects of technology is its reach potential, the ability to push out to very large numbers of end users evidence-based therapeutic support tools. By centrally deploying these tools and, and ensuring that uh, they can be widely accessed, again, all over the world. And when we deliver technologies in this way, we can assure that they're delivered uh, with quality, so we know that there's going to be fidelity in the way that these interventions are used, and they can be wedded to science-based interventions and empirically supported care. And we also have uh, an unprecedented opportunity, I think, with technology to offer new levels of personalization in the resources that we provide. So if the data suggests that there are dimensions on which we need to personalize, like people's cultural considerations or cognitive functioning level or whatever profile of needs and preferences they present with, we can create systems that flexibly respond and are adaptive to that. Additionally, this is a new opportunity for patient engagement, for patient empowerment. Allowing people to play new leading roles in their own care management. This is very different than our traditional models of physician-patient relationships and, again, allows for new levels of patient empowerment. Another promise of this approach is the opportunity for on-demand access. So this idea that you can have anytime, anywhere, 24-7 access to therapeutic tools and resources that may be meaningful to you, may have utility to you as an end user. And some people call this just-in-time therapeutic support. So the idea is that when you may need access to some clinical support tool, you may have it available to you right there in your pocket. And there are a growing uh, number of studies that have shown that when you use mobile tools and resources in this way, that you can indeed prevent costly escalation of clinical problems and associated unnecessary healthcare utilization. So, for example, we just finished a trial with chronic pain patients who were receiving pretty much medical interventions, opioid medication, injection treatments, surger surgical types of procedures, and we evaluated if we add onto that care model an interactive web-based program that can help people manage chronic pain and to prevent chronic pain from ruining their lives and their relationships, how does that impact outcomes? And what we found when you use tools in this way is that not only could we in improve management of chronic pain, but we actually saw decreases in emergency department visits related 
related to pain. So people were able to manage their pain better and in new ways to prevent this costly escalation of the problem leading to emergency department visits. There's also um, an, an exciting opportunity, I think, in the space of using technology to help address healthcare disparities and stigma that we see in many of our traditional models of healthcare. We know that there are still many populations that do not get access to the care that they need. But again, we know that virtually the entire population globally has access to mobile devices. And so again, this is an extraordinary opportunity for us to think about how can we leverage these tools to help address some of the disparities we see in our traditional models of care. Some of the healthcare systems and other partners that we work with are very interested in using technology to increase service capacity so that is, by offloading some of your service delivery model to a technology platform or technology system, you can see more people, more patients, with the same number of clinician resources. So you're increasing your service capacity by embedding technology as part of your offering in your care model. I'll show you some data from examples of that type of model of deployment. So I'm not trying to suggest that technology is the solution to all of the complexities and challenges that we have in our healthcare system, but the data are very compelling, and I'll give you a sort of a big picture summary of what we're seeing in this space later in the talk, but the data are very compelling that there's a terrific opportunity to leverage these tools to have a public health impact at a population level. So as I mentioned, access to the internet, access to, the, uh, to mobile devices has been growing at extraordinary rates. The latest statistic is that 98% of the world's population has access to mobile phone services. So right now the estimates are just about 7.5 billion mobile phone subscriptions worldwide. And many of these mobile devices are smartphones, which probably most of you have, if not all of you, and smartphones have extraordinary computational capacity. They allow for sensing, they allow for access to the internet, they allow for social media utilization, they allow for intervention deliveries that can be quite sophisticated. And smartphones are also increasing in prevalence. So we see that the expectations are that smartphone access will triple globally by 2019. And virtually every population you can think of, every demographic group, every SES group, folks in low and middle income countries as well as high income countries are increasingly getting access to these devices. So again, this just underscores the opportunity for how to intersect technology into health and healthcare. So we have had the um, privilege to start here at Dartmouth a center, the Center for Technology and Behavioral Health, which Dr. Hanlon mentioned. And this is an NIH-supported center, and the mission of the center is really to use science to inform the development and the evaluation, as well as the implementation of various technology-based therapeutic tools for behavioral health, which includes things like substance use disorders and mental health disorders, but also for health behavior broadly. When you think about chronic disease management, when you think about preventative health, there are important behavioral dimensions, such as medical regimen adherence, that hugely impact outcomes. And so our work is in this broad space of health and wellness, from prevention, treatment, recovery support, to care coordination. So CTBH is housed at Dartmouth, and we're so fortunate to uh, have partners all over campus. So CTBH sits within the Geisel School of Medicine, but we have affiliates in the center that are in arts and sciences, in computer science, in Thayer engineering, and in TDI. And additionally, we have the opportunity to work with partners in the center all over the country, as well as a growing a group of international partners in the center. And I think what's really exciting about this group is that it is truly interdisciplinary. So we, we have folks that specialize in behavioral health and the science of behavior change, but we also have collaborators that specialize in things like ubiquitous computing and data analytics and emerging technologies and novel research methodologies in this space and um, implementation research and health economics and health policy and social media. 
And the group focuses on a wide array of phenomena from substance use to mental health to chronic pain to HIV to trauma to managing chronic physical health conditions like diabetes and hypertension and obesity. And um, with many populations, from small children and adolescents to uh, aging populations to chronic drug users to smokers to um, people living with HIV, people living with other chronic medical conditions. And the work that the center does is done in many contexts. So it's not only in addiction and mental health specialty programs, but also in primary care and in hospitals and in emergency departments and in criminal justice settings and in schools and colleges and direct to consumer online types of studies. And I mention this because I want to underscore that technology can be useful in adding value to care delivery in a wide array of contexts and for a wide array of populations. So the work that the center is involved in is very translational in that it, it involves a lot of basic work in developing and refining technologies and tools to understanding questions of are they feasible, are they comprehensible, are they acceptable to lots of different end users. We do a lot of experimental trials um, looking at, you know, do these tools work? How do they work? What are the mechanisms of action? How can we make them more potent? Um, two, we do a lot of national um, studies, multi-site types of studies of clinical effectiveness and cost effectiveness. And then we have a core of the center focused on implementation research, which is on how do you take an empirically supported technology system and promote its adoption and sustained use in some care delivery system in a way that brings value to all the stakeholders in that system. So not just the end user, not just the consumer or the patient, but the clinicians and the payers and the regulatory structures that these things sit within. Um, and so really understanding what's going to um, add value from multiple stakeholder perspectives. So in this space where you see this tremendous interest in mobile health and all kinds of gadgets emerging that can help you with all kinds of aspects of health, our center is, is focused on using science to develop methodological and conceptual frameworks to drive in a science-based way transformation of healthcare using technology. So this slide summarizes about 15 or 16 years of um, research from using technology with a wide array of populations. Um, I'm going to show you some data in a minute, but I want to give you sort of the big picture of what we see in this space, which is if you develop these tools well, and development is, it can hugely impact the effectiveness of these types of tools. But if you develop tools that really have value and relevance to the experience and utility to your end user, you can generally see this pattern of results which is that you can have tools that are highly useful and acceptable to diverse populations. You can have a large impact on health behavior and health outcome for many different types of end users. You can see outcomes that are as good as and often better than what we get with clinician-delivered care. And some people react to that and say, oh, you're trying to replace clinician-delivered care with technology systems. And what we know is that, first of all, in some cases, we don't have a sufficient workforce to meet need for clinical services, like in the behavioral health arena that we work heavily in. We know that there's an insufficient behavioral health workforce to meet need, and so there's a tremendous opportunity to think about alternative ways that are scalable to reach unmet need. We also know that people aren't with their clinician all the time, right? They have these episodic, sort of infrequent connections with the healthcare system. And so it's important for us to understand that there are active ingredients in these tools that can have an impact on behavior, and including health behavior, as people move through their daily lives. We also see that we do indeed um, can increase quality, reach, and personalization of care with this approach. These can be cost-effective tools. And also, I think what's quite exciting is that these do not have to be static systems. They don't have to work in a very rigid, specific way. But rather, they can be adaptive. They can change, and what's offered to an individual can change over time based on people's changing clinical trajectories and their needs and preferences. I'd like to say a few words about behavioral health, just to first sort of underscore the significance of addressing this in the work that we do. Mental health and substance use disorders are quite common, perhaps more than, than you may know. About one to four to about one to five 
adults are diagnosable in this country with one or more mental health disorders. And about one in 10 are diagnosable with one or more substance use disorders. And what we know is that individuals who have these behavioral health challenges are among the most frequent and the costliest utilizers of our healthcare system. So the estimates are that about um, the annual economic cost of mental health disorders is about 300 billion. And the World Health Organization um, indicates that mental illness accounts for more disability in developed countries than other groups of illnesses, including things like cancer and heart disease. So if you're not familiar with these statistics, they're very compelling. And this underscores not only how common these challenges are, but how important they are in their own regard. But additionally, what's also important is the important role that behavioral health problems play in other areas of healthcare management, such as physical health conditions, chronic physical health conditions. We know that behavioral health problems are highly prevalent among populations with chronic physical health conditions, which about 45% of Americans have one or more chronic physical health conditions, and accounts for about 75% of our healthcare costs. So for example, folks who have diabetes have roughly between 40 to 72% co-occurring incidence of depression and about 50% co-occurring incidence of anxiety. And what we know is that when behavioral health problems are comorbid with other physical health conditions, the outcomes of care are worse and the cost of care is higher. So we see things like lower quality of care, poor response to treatment, worse medical and psychiatric outcomes, higher mortality and higher cost of care. When these types of problems co-occur versus when they do not. So back to the case of depression and diabetes, when these things co-occur, we know that healthcare costs increase by 50 to 75% versus diabetes management in the absence of depression. So we know behavioral health challenges are common. We know that they interact in very important ways with other aspects of health and wellness. And we're also living in a time where we have this changing healthcare landscape. The whole healthcare marketplace has changed in a way to now incentivize healthcare systems to embrace behavioral health challenges in the context of general medical care settings. So really covering the full spectrum of health and wellness and not having um, sort of siloed models of care for behavioral health, particularly in accountable care organizations. And what we know is that in this space, general medical settings like primary care systems, for example, do not have sufficient capacity to meet this need. If we really think about the scope of this problem, and now we're asking primary care settings to embrace this as part of their care model, we don't have the workforce there to meet this need in a way that's scalable. And so I think this is one of the important timely and significant opportunities to think about technology. Can we take empirically supported behavioral health tools, behavior change tools, therapeutic support tools, and embed them into these care models to help facilitate this integration of care? And again, this is not just for behavioral health, things like substance use and mental health, but we know that behavior in general, health behavior, such as you know, what do you eat and whether or not you exercise, accounts for as much as 40% of the illness, suffering, and early death related to chronic diseases. These are modifiable risk factors. These are modifiable behaviors. And again, this is an, an opportunity for, for points of intersection with technology to address these, and again, in a way that has um, tremendous reach potential. So let's say that you're a healthcare system and you're excited about the promise of technology and you're thinking about, well, how could I embrace this and, and, and adopt it in what I do in my care delivery model? Well, there are lots and lots of ways you could do this, lots of creative and exciting ways that are being explored in this space. I'm just going to talk about a few examples of these to give you a flavor of the kinds of things you could do. And then I'm going to show you some examples from studies that have actually tested out these models of deployment to give you a, a sense of the kinds of outcomes you can see in this space. So one example is you could just say, okay, we're going to offer a suite of technology tools as a supplement to what we do already. We're going to offer this as an adjunct to our existing model of care. More tools, more tools in our toolbox, more resources that we offer to patients that we treat. Some people call this a clinician extender model, and the idea is that you're extending the reach and the impact of your clinical workforce, of the work that you do already with these types of tools. 
An alternative approach to embedding technology in a care model is to actually replace a portion of a typical client-clinician interaction with a technology system. So you're actually offloading some of your service delivery model to technology systems. Well, why would you want to do that? Well, as I mentioned earlier, there are some systems of care that would be very keen to do this if they could increase their service capacity. Programs that have long wait lists, for example. They could treat more people with the same number of clinician resources. Alternatively, this kind of model of care could allow clinicians to have more time to deal with patients who have more intensive needs, who need more time. And so this kind of model could help allow for that. And yet, a, a different model altogether is just to think about offering these tools as standalone interventions. We don't have to limit access through, through healthcare systems, but rather can go direct to consumer in this approach. So this might be very relevant in rural settings where people don't have access. It may be relevant in situations where people don't want to go to our traditional models of care. Again, an example from the behavioral health space, 90% of people in this country who are diagnosable with a substance use or mental health problem do not go to our existing models of care. We're touching 10% of people with these complex challenges in our models of care. What an unmet need and what an extraordinary opportunity to think about new ways to access and provide resources to this population. So what I'd like to do now is show you some data. And I'm going to show you data from one tool that's just an example of a technology tool in this space. It, this one happens to be one that we and others um, have had the chance to study for in maybe seven or so NIH projects. And, and this happens to be an interactive web-based tool that's mobile accessible for substance use disorders. So this is to help people change problematic drug use. And this tool, I'm not going to go into a lot of detail about it. I'd be glad to talk about it in more detail if folks are interested. But the tool is basically wedded to sort of the gold standard of behavioral treatments for addiction care and uses informational technologies that are interactive that are designed to promote engagement and skills acquisition and help people apply what they're learning to their daily lives. So it's really sort of taking the science in these two fields and merging them into this interactive platform. But I'm not going to talk a lot about the tool, but rather what I'd like to do is to show you the kinds of patterns of findings you can see when you offer a tool like this in different models of deployment. Okay, some of the examples, that, ex data examples of some of the models that I just described to you. So the first trial is a partial replacement model, which basically showed that if you replace 80% of addiction treatment with mobile technology, outcomes are as good as a gold standard of clinician-delivered treatment. Okay, so let me tell you about the design. These were opioid-addicted adults. So these are folks addicted to heroin or prescription opioids, which I'm sure you all hear you know, the, the national dialogue about the growing problem we have in this country with opioid addiction and overdose deaths associated with opioid addiction. And that is this population. These are adults entering treatment for opioid addiction. And everyone in this study received this medication. It's, it's called Suboxone. The generic name is buprenorphine. And it's a medication that stabilizes the brain neurochemistry of people with opioid addiction. But what varied here is the kind of treatment that people got over and above the medication. So the folks who are re represented here in the blue bar are, are participants who received the state of the science behavioral treatments for drug addiction delivered by highly trained clinicians, delivered with lots of fidelity checks in place to ensure that it's being delivered in the most sort of maximally potent way. Okay? Folks who went into the group that's represented in red here, they had clinicians, but they saw them maybe one out of every six sessions, and the majority of the therapeutic intervention offered to them was delivered through this web-based resource that I described. And then folks who are reflected here in the gray arm are patients who received what's called standard counseling and addiction treatment. What most of our addiction treatment systems around the U.S. offer to this population of opioid-addicted patients. 
And so the message here is that even when you offload a majority, roughly 80% of your treatment platform to a mobile technology, the outcomes are comparable to what you get from exclusively de clinician-delivered care, both of which are better than what we typically do in this country for addiction treatment. So we're getting outcomes that are comparable to the gold standard of care. So that's one example of how you could use this kind of approach. And again, in, in addiction treatment programs, you may or may not know, they often have extraordinarily long wait lists. And so a model like this could help with increasing service capacity. Now here's another example. This was another NIH-funded uh, trial which showed that if we replace half of clinician-delivered addiction treatment in community-based addiction treatment settings, we actually get better outcomes than what we, do, what we get if technology is not part of the care delivery model. Okay, so these are folks entering treatment. They either went into what's called treatment as usual, which is medication treatment and, and behavioral treatments and, and, support and therapeutic support offered at the treatment site. And then folks who went into this condition actually had their patient clinician contact time cut in half, and instead they were offered access to this web-based platform. And when we replaced clinician-delivered care in this way, we had higher rates of abstinence from drugs of abuse. These were opioids. This was an opioid-addicted sample, and this is based on objective urinalysis testing. All of these data I'm showing you are based on objective, quantifiable data. So we get better outcomes, much higher rates of, of abstinence in treatment when you offer this as part of the care model versus when you don't in our standard addiction treatment systems in the U.S. And then one more example I'll show to you is the, is the idea of adding mobile technology as a supplement, as an adjunct to what we do in a care system. And in this trial, when we added this mobile tool for addiction care into addiction treatment, we actually saw markedly higher treatment retention. So we kept 84% of people in treatment when they enter treatment for the first three months of that treatment episode, which was the evaluation window, compared to 56% of folks who did not get access to this tool. So you offer this simple tool as part of the care model, and you keep more people engaged in treatment. And treatment retention in, the, in, in substance abuse treatment is a very strong predictor of positive outcomes, positive clinical outcomes. But the same pattern emerged when we looked at urine, urinalysis test results. Again, adding this mobile intervention actually translated into less opioid use compared to if you didn't have it as part of the care model. So a simple resource that's not changing your baseline level of care, but rather offering another tool to what you offer to your patients can produce effects that have an impact in this way. And you know, this is with chronic drug abuse. This is a very difficult to change behavior. But what's exciting is that I'm, I'm just showing some examples, but we also see similar robust effects in many other areas of health. I'm just going to show you some examples here of some of the findings we've seen in this work. So, for example, I mentioned this trial earlier. We've seen that we can, with mobile tools, increase management of pain, chronic pain, and reduce associated emergency department utilization associated with pain. We can promote smoking cessation. We have games that we've developed for children and adolescents, multimedia games, that have been shown to increase self-esteem and reduce impulsivity among children. We see in lots of different populations, youth and adults, that we can reduce HIV risk behavior with these types of tools. We can reduce clinical depression. We can reduce problematic alcohol use associated with trauma. We can prevent drug use in adolescents. Some of our work with criminal justice populations, we've found that we can reduce relapse to drug use and HIV risk behavior among prisoners after they are leaving a period of incarceration. And then additionally, another example is that we can promote medical regimen adherence among lots of different chronic disease patients. So it's very interesting to me in having the opportunity to work in this whole sort of landscape of research to see the kinds of robust findings that we can, that we observe across a wide array of populations and in a lot of contexts. And so I th what's really interesting in the space is that a lot of the core functionality that drives behavior change transcends population. It transcends diagnosis or disorder labels. 
there are fundamental principles of the science of behavior change and how do you activate behavior change and how do you teach people new skills to apply these to their lives and how do you reinforce it and motivate it. There are fundamental principles in this space that apply to so much of the work that we do independent of population and context. And so as we think about transforming healthcare with technology, I think one of the many opportunities for us is to transcend siloed models of care, right? So when you look at mobile health tools that are out there, you see here's an app for depression. This one's if you wanna track your sleep and you use this other thing if you wanna track your activity levels. And if you have a substance use problem, you use yet a different tool. And what we know is that these problems often co-occur and what we know is that a, a large amount of what drives effects and drives behavior change across a wide array of problems overlaps across different populations. And so we don't have to put artificial constraints on technology platforms to just have siloed tools, but rather can embrace this full spectrum in an integrated platform. And an example of that, we've been, um, as part of a startup that I'm involved in, have, been, have created an integrated platform that's really designed to take the principles of the science of behavior change and create self-monitoring and health behavior change tools that are arguably usable and useful to any end user. So there's a common sort of portal of entry and resources and tools that people can use, but then based on their own profile of needs and preferences, then you can bring in all the science-based tools for whatever their issues are, whether it be drug abuse, whether it be pain, whether it be hypertension management, whether it be medical um, regimen adherence. So we call this system square two. It's kind of like a don't go back to square one, you know, so square two. And, um, and the idea is to um, embrace the fundamental principles of a science behavior change, again, that can be flexibly used by different end users. So I'm just gonna show you an example of this to show you the kinds of things that you can do in this space. So square two embraces things like behavior, what's called behavioral activation, how do you activate behavior change, problem solving therapy, cognitive behavioral skills therapy, principles of behavioral economics that have been shown to be important incentivizing and motivating behavior change. But it does it in a way where you don't have to take on a label. You don't have to say you have DSM-5 diagnosis X and here's the treatment for that, but rather it's What's important to you? What, what are your values? What are your goals? Who's the person you want to be? And what's getting in the way? What are the barriers to this? Maybe it's depression. Maybe it's insomnia. Maybe it's something else. So the idea is to provide resources to help people achieve personal goals and bringing in all the science in a way that can be used in this kind of framework. So just a few screenshots. This is a mobile app that has different um, sort of features where you can go through an exercise of identifying values and goal setting. There's lots of guides, hundreds of guides, and growing that can, continue, that can be pulled in based on your combination of needs and preferences. So you can go through a functionality of identifying values. It includes things like value sorting exercise. What, what's most important to you? What's least important to you? How do you translate that into objective, measurable goals, things you can track? So maybe someone wants to lose weight, or maybe someone wants to change their diet, or maybe someone wants to deal with depressive symptoms, or maybe someone wants to deal with a chronic medical illness. These can all be things that are tracked and measured. This is just an example of one of the guides um, that are in the program. But on your mobile device, this is a kind of interface you can update on a daily basis. So this person's tracking their weight every day and putting in on the right column what their weight is. Um, they have a goal of exercising more than two times every seven days, and so they update when they've done that. They want to measure the, on this happiness scale. What's their score today on a happiness scale? And they can measure that. They want to drink eight ounces of water each day, eight ounce glass of water each day, at least eight times. And so they can measure how many they've done. So you can track on this interface what you're doing for anything you want to track. And then you can see a historical grid of your ability to meet your goals over time. So again, this is a single screen on a mobile device with all of these icons. So you have these icons associated with your goals. And so your weight, you can see, well, this person started here, and now currently this is the current weight. And then for activity levels, you can see their trajectory over time. For the happiness scale, you can see their score over time. So this person was drinking eight glasses per day, but look, today they only drank seven glasses. And so this, this troubleshooting 
functionality pops up and it says, you know, what sort of what happened here? Let's figure out what could you do differently to be successful next time. So there's lots of troubleshooting pieces that pop in based on how you're doing. These are data that are input by end users. This system can also pull in sensing data. It can pull in lots of data from different devices. And again, there's functionality to to help people when they're ch challenged with motivation or having obstacles, and there are different resources you can pull in for that. There's a social media piece where you can have the system automatically communicate your successes and your sort of journey um, in working toward your goals with an, an extended support network of your choosing. And so it could be your, your sister or your child or your mother or your friends. And you can have automatic reporting of, look, I got a 20, which is a great score on my happiness scale. Or I had 14 days in a row that I met my goal of not drinking coffee after 3 o'clock in the afternoon. And so you can have this kind of social exchange where people can reinforce your progress along the way in the journey, not unlike people, the way people use social media. But also there's a virtual prize cabinet that actually uses principles of behavioral economics to try to help promote and incentivize people in achieving milestones along the way. So you can share this with a support network of your choosing, which may be a clinician. This is a clinician heat map, we call it. So let's say you're a clinician and you want to track something about your patients. And I should just pause and say that I think in the mobile health space, sometimes there's an assumption that all the rich data that we collect with these types of tools need to be fed to your clinician. And what we reliably find is that clinicians do not want lots of lots of inactionable data, right? So they want it increases their liability, it may not be relevant to them, but there sometimes are pieces of things that, th that may help them in doing the work that they're doing with their patient. So let's say you're a clinician and you would like to track what's called PHQ scores, patient health questionnaire scores, which is a measure of depression symptomatology. Say you have six people that you're tracking this for, each person is represented by a column. Well, you can see for this first person, the actual value of their score on this over time, um, but what's uh, what sort of is, is intended to jump out at you is the color. So it's a heat map. And the idea is that as people start to move into a range of the scale that is concerning, then it becomes increasingly red and sort of can immediately flag you with that visual that this is someone that may need some intervention. So I point this out because I think that I want to illustrate that there's an opportunity for us not to just have siloed approaches to care. We can use technology in new ways to facilitate integrated care. We can use it in ways that are adaptive and responsive to people's changing clinical needs and preferences over time. And we can use it both within and outside of healthcare systems. This piece of engaging the clinician and sharing data is optional. The system can work without it. And, and I think that's very helpful because a lot of people may choose to benefit from using resources like this even outside of healthcare systems, but they can have value when integrated into healthcare systems. So I think an additional opportunity for us as we think about transforming healthcare with science based technology is to think about new partnerships, new academic industry partnerships. So instead of sort of a group of scientists and a group of clinicians doing this work and then um, hoping to sort of push out tools that are implementable, I think we need to have the right stakeholders at the table. We need to have the industry partners who can understand the cost and the regulatory and the commercial market considerations of these types of tools so that we're really reality checking what we're developing and actually having the opportunity to create maximally potent and cost effective and widely implementable solutions. So I'm very interested in trialing digitally driven business enterprises. And the idea is that let's take this growing science, and it's a very exciting field that's evolving rapidly, and let's trial new models of healthcare delivery that at the heart employ digital technologies. In, in the heart of healthcare operations. We see this happening in all kinds of areas of business, but it has not been embraced in a way yet that has shown value or has really had a true test in the healthcare space. So this is really a different type of research, right? This is sort of innovation and evaluation in context, in the real world trialing things and iterating and refining what we're doing. It's very consistent with the Institute of Medicine's idea of a learning healthcare system. <clears throat> and I'm 
excited about the potential, based on the wide array of data that I've seen in this space, for this kind of approach to address some of the systemic barriers we have in delivering science-based approaches to healthcare that transcend disease and population and context and really get at the core of generalizable and scalable solutions in this space. We have a colleague at Mayo um, named Victor Montori who writes about this concept of minimally disruptive health care. So the concept is this, that if you have one or more physical health conditions, a chronic physical health condition, the illness is very burdensome. But the care for the illness is very burdensome. You have to go to a bunch of different specialists and manage multiple different prescriptions and manage lots of different tests and coordinate that with your primary care physician. And it's very burdensome to manage this. And so this concept is around how do we create integrated systems that can minimize the burden of our healthcare system. And I think there's a terrific opportunity to think of technology as minimally disruptive healthcare in the space of prevention and assessment and treatment and recovery support and facilitating care coordination models, this entire digital, enter this entire enterprise of healthcare. And I just want to mention again one last plug for direct-to-consumer because we're talking a lot about healthcare systems, but there's a, there's a huge market demand. You see this growing in a lot of spaces for consumers to have new levels of understanding of their health and health behavior and opportunities for healthcare management, even outside of healthcare systems. And so this is an opportunity that I think, again, we can scale up the science and test this in new models. And then finally on this slide, I'd just like to mention again the important opportunities in the space of global health here. So we see even in low and middle income countries as well as high income countries, you know, countries may not even have a landline infrastructure, but yet they have mobile phones, right? Even in, so we're working with um, a, a number of Latin American countries on using technology systems to embed care for depression and substance use disorders into primary care in Latin America. And even in the most rural of settings, we find that people have these devices. And so what an opportunity to take advantage of this infrastructure to help communities realize health-related goals in their healthcare system. And then one final point here in this idea of transforming healthcare with science-based technology, I think there is a terrific opportunity for us to train the next generation of leaders in this space. You know, thinking about our clinicians of the future, how can we not only inform them in the, in the educational programs that we offer uh, in, about the changing healthcare landscape and health policy and sort of the new healthcare marketplace, but also importantly, what's evolving in this field of digitally driven disruptive innovation? And what do we know about ubiquitous computing and, and, and um, data analytics and their promise from this growing body of data to create new models of health promotion? So I have to shamelessly plug our book. <laughs> um, we were, this is an edited volume that the Oxford University Press uh, published, and we were so fortunate to get such terrific authors to contribute to this, really truly leaders in their field, who together in this volume have reviewed the state of the science of how to best develop technology tools in the health space, how to best evaluate them, what are opportunities in evaluation, as well as opportunities in implementation, what are the regulatory considerations, FDA considerations, all kinds of different topics have been embraced in this volume. So for folks who may have interest in this space, um, I wanted to make sure you knew about this resource. And with that, I'll say thank you, and I, again, thanks so much for your interest in this, and again, for the invitation to share this work with you. Thank you. So we have about five or six minutes. If folks have questions or comments, there's a mic that we can pass around. It's not working? Mike's not working? <laughs> you can yell really loud. OK. <laughs> <laughs> I can repeat the question if you'd like. Madam. Um, thank you, Lisa. That was great. I, uh, as we know, it takes a really long time sorry, to develop um, evidence-based technology and things that we have tested and we know scientifically work. And, and I think there is a lot of 
future in this. And so the flip side is that there's probably going to be a lot of businesses that are putting out things that aren't well tested. Right. Um, have you thought about kind of any kind of regulation or branding or licensing? Like how will the consumer know the difference mm -hmm. between something that has been tested and is effective and something that is just on the market? Yeah. For I think that's a great question. And I think this is part of the importance of having the right partnerships, the academic and industry partnerships together to have the groups there that sort of can bring what they do best to that initiative. So the academic partners can bring the science to this and the careful evaluation of this. But the industry partners who are moving to the space anyway can have the science feed what they do, but do it in a way that really is going to have the promise of being scalable and having a sort of population level impact. But I think you're right that right now there's a lot happening in, in industry and tools being pushed out that we have no idea if they're effective or not, or perhaps, you know, in some cases may um, be harmful, but we don't know because they haven't been carefully studied. And yet, what's being developed carefully in the scientific community isn't getting out in the field. It's just going into publications or talks at scientific meetings. And that's an enormous problem. <laughs> and so I think that this is the opportunity for us to have new models of partnerships and shared vision and shared mission in the work that we do to merge these things together. Because it is a very difficult marketplace for consumers right now to navigate, I think. Um, it, it, as just an aside, the center website actually is listed here. We do have what's called a program review resource where we've tried to create a centralized resource for people to understand the presence or absence of any empirical support for a wide array of tech tools that are out there. So you sort of you can go there and sort of get a flavor in non-scientific language about, you know, about the question you're asking. But it's not the solution. I think we need entirely new models of development and evaluation with new partners. Yeah. Any more questions? Do you have any idea how much time your substance abuse clients used the app, like per day or per week? Mm -hmm. Well, what we find is that most people with, who are trying to change chronic addiction generally use a tool like I described today on a fairly ongoing basis. So it's not sort of a brief intervention. These are resources that are really helping people to change patterns of behavior that are self-defeating and, and really learn new lifestyle, uh, you know, sort of restructure lifestyle and learn new skills and sort of new patterns of behavior to replace that. And so typically, we've tested this in all kinds of different models, but typically we've looked at it in, um, you know, up from 24 weeks up to 12 months of use. But I, I want, your question raises an important point, which is I think sometimes in this field, we, um, in, in the scientific work in this field, we make the assumption that the more you use it, the better the outcome, sort of this dose effect kind of thing. And that if you stop using the tool, then you're non-adherent and it's a problem. But what we're seeing in this space is that what there are some very clear mechanisms of behavior change that we see really drive effects. And the, the, the rate and so the pace at which we can actually impact varies a lot across individuals. And it might be that if we're trying to teach new patterns of behavior, people may internalize these. It may be part of their you know, behavioral repertoire that they engage in on a daily basis. And they may not need continual access to this therapeutic support tool. Maybe it helps them start that pattern of behavior. But maybe the strategic episodic use thereafter might be helpful. Or new types of resources based on sort of their changes over time. So, these are important um, empirical questions for us to ask as well, I think. We probably can only take one more because of time, but we can also chat in the lobby afterwards. Is there one more that we could squeeze in? Yeah. Great talk as always. Uh, related to the first question, we're almost paradoxically as a research enterprise or a scientific enterprise, we're in a, in a in a love triangle with technology where you know things are discovered in academia and then they uh, take Fitbit or anything for it and then they go to tech and then we end up playing catch up um, and then we bring it back into our research uh, sphere. Mm -hmm. Can we close that gap somehow so that yeah. we don't end up playing catch up to technology and instead take things that are found in academia, take affectiva for example, mm -hmm. you know, uh, artificial intelligence-based 
facial recognition of emotions and take it directly to research. And so maybe then we can hasten our ability to take it to the clinic instead of mm -hmm. you know playing catch up. I think it's a great question, and I think it first of all underscores the importance of interdisciplinary partnerships and um, sort of new types of partnerships, so that we're not working in these silos in academia. I think that's really important. I think it also speaks to the types of research designs that we do. I mean, randomized clinical trials are very elegant, but they're incredibly lengthy, and by the time you learn what you're trying to learn, the results are outdated. But I think it also speaks to the type of studies that we can do, which is we know that the technology of the moment is going to change rapidly, right? We know that. But what we can do, I think, is understand what are the fundamental pr fundamental principles by which we can employ these tools in the therapeutic space and what's going to sort of transcend the technology of the moment because there are some principles in this space that persist even as the actual gadget of the day or the social media site of the day change and I think there's a lot of opportunity in our work to have some guiding principles around that so thanks for the question and thank you all again for coming